Oh, I got one. You got one? Oh, there isn't a meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, to add it to the... Yeah. Feel free to interrupt me if I don't say that at the end. It's usually at the end of the agenda. Thank you for sending that to I was just sharing with Tanya that I can't believe it's almost June. And I can't believe that we're already up on that. She told me that she had the meeting and she... That's ridiculous. Because of Jade Hill, you know Jade? What was her name? Jade invited me. Oh, Jade, oh. She was one of my kids at Sheridan from kindergarten through fifth grade, and she asked me if I would come, and I said, absolutely. I'm speaking at my graduation Are you? Year. Good, sweetie, I'll see I you am. too. Yeah. I think you did. No. I forgot. 30 seconds. Yes. Yeah, soda and gloss. Good evening. I'd like to call the May 11th Tacoma School Board meeting to order. And let's please begin with a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can we please have a roll call? President Oshka. I'm present. Director Winskill. Here. Director Hines. Here. Director Vial. Here. And is uh, Director Cobb excused for the record? Director Cobb is excused. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. I move adoption. Second. The motion's been moved and second. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes, four <laughs> zero. This brings us to item number five, which is recognition of staff, students, and community. 5.1 is recognition of Wilson High School senior Bryce Asberg as a 2017 National Merit Scholar. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Ushka and members of the board. I'm sure most of the folks in this room and a lot of the folks watching at home have heard of the National Merit Scholar Award. This award was first created in 1955 to honor students based on a combination of their scores on the PSAT National Merit Scholar Qualifying Test and their extra extracurricular activities. More than 1.5 million students in 22,000 high schools across the U.S. compete for this award every year, but each year only 7,500 students across the country earn the highest honor, and this year one student in Tacoma Public Schools stood head and shoulders above the others and became a National Merit Scholar. To introduce you to Bryce, our lone winner, is someone who knows him a lot better than me, Wilson High School's Assistant Principal Bernadette Ray. Bernadette? Good evening, President Ushka. Board of Directors, Superintendent Santorno, Deputy Superintendent Garcia, student representatives, and all those others who are here. Um, it's my absolute honor to introduce you all to Bryce. Um, he has always stood head and shoulders above the rest um, in a lot of ways. And he is our valedictorian this year. He is also the class speaker. At Wilson, the valedictorian isn't automatically the class speaker, so he had to compete. Um, for that position to be able to, to address his class at graduation. He's also the founder and president of the Wilson Students for Life Club, and he is a uh, leader in this charge of 
um, students because we actually have three juniors who are qualified to be National Merit Scholars for next year. So we thank Bryce for leading the way and um, directing others to greatness. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Bryce Asberg. Uh, thank you, President Ushka and Superintendent Santorno and members of the board. Um, I'm thankful to be here, and I'll do the Wheel of Fortune thing. I'm here with my lovely mother and father. Would you please wave? <laughs> Thank you. And then just some people I wanted to thank. Um, when I think of my education and the revolutionary moments, I have to think of fourth grade joining the SAIL program um, and being taught by Mrs. Sentizi, the best teacher I've ever had. Um, and that's truly been revolutionary for me. So <clears throat> thank you and Tacoma School District for making that possible. And thanks to Mrs. Santizi for being such a great teacher. Um, and then six teachers I wanted to recognize at Wilson, Mrs. Orlando, Mrs. Rayberg, Mrs. Van Rye, Mr. Richardson, Mr. Judson, and Mr. Jen Canish. Um, and they've all been great teachers. And I'm just so thankful for the education I've been able to receive through Tacoma Public Schools and specifically at Wilson, which I haven't experienced anything else, but I'm willing to bet that we have the best teachers in the district. Um, I, okay, bias, whatever. Um, and so next summer, or this fall actually, I will be attending Hillsdale College in Michigan. Um, and I'm excited to see how TPS has prepared me for that. So thank you all. Item 5.2, which is the recognition of 2016 Washington Achievement Award winner for Lowell Elementary School. Thank you, President Ushkin, members of the board. Clearly, we're into award season. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the highlights uh, of the year is the Washington Achievement Award given to the best performing schools <coughs> across the state. Uh, you know, this is a difficult award to win primarily because it requires a school to demonstrate improved academic performance in both standardized test scores for reading and math and academic growth of its students over a rolling three-year period. So because of that standard, in the majority of cases and, and in past years in Tacoma, uh, a lot of the winners start at a, a lower level of achievement. But that is not the case uh, with this year's winner, which makes the honor even more impressive. For its achievement of high progress in student learning, it's my pleasure to introduce Principal Renee Rossman and the distinguished staff of Lowell Elementary School. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Thank you to the school board. Thank you to Superintendent Santorno, Assistant Superintendent, um, all of the guests that are here in the room, teachers, everybody that is here, and the staff at Lowell that's, that's behind me, but yet uh, surrounds me every day with wonderful instruction. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to, to go to the ceremony last, um, last week. Um, I also want to say thank you to Rita Chandri, my director. She's here in attendance, uh, along with her family. I couldn't do it without Rita's support. This means the world to me, and I, I'm going to try to just be as strong as I can because <coughs> it's very emotional. Um, it's emotional because the bar is already set really high at Lowell, and as you know, coming into Lowell is it's just an amazing gift. Um, I'm taking mm -hmm. over the legacy and footsteps of uh, John Armour and, and Bob Dahl, who preceded me for many, many years, and so the opportunity to be a, a, a leader as a principal there in the community and to, to lead Lowell to this uh, magnitude of an award is just something that I, I treasure. But the team behind me are the ones that are in the trenches doing the work. 
So how do we how do we get to this point of having high achievement at a school that's already having a really high bar and has hi real high test scores in the community? Um, I always think of great coaches, and I think of, of a, a Duke basketball team. To get to the Final Four every year takes recruitment, coaching, strategy, a belief system, a mission statement, and everybody buying in. And I say that to the teachers all the time, is we have to believe that we can't be, we can't be complacent. We can't be happy with having scores in the 80s. We have to continue to work as hard as we can to raise the bar every single year. So I always, I think I'm an ESPN uh, lover at heart. Um, I believe in good coaching and I feel that as an instructional leader at my school that helping teachers to get the best teachers in every classroom is my main goal. Um, our growth mindset is also valuable. So we believe in Carol Dweck's book, Growth Mindset. When I first got to Lowell, we talked about what it's like to have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, but that's also for our students. That's also for staff, and it's also for parents. It helps us to know that we can never, ever be afraid to fail. We can't be happy, and we also don't want to have a, 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 um, a smart uh, a label around students. We want to have grit and hard work. So our low pod not only is safe, and kind and responsible and respectful, but the middle of our paw is grit because our students have to work as hard as they possibly can to continue setting the bar even higher. Um, we also believe, I also believe, that staffing re requires change. And change can be a scary thing when I've been at the same school teaching the same grade level for many, many years. So it's stepping into new areas of, of disequilibrium and uncertainty. It's changing grade levels and start starting something new. It's, it's planning together in a grade level team where I've maybe done the same thing for many, many years, but now I'm trying some new strategies. It's also um, looking for teacher leaders and empowering those teacher leaders to do the work in the trenches. And it's also looking for the best skills and talents in the district to recruit the very, very best for every single classroom at Lowell. It's rotations. In fourth and fifth grade, where our, our teachers select their curriculum that they're passionate about. They teach that three times a day to dive as deeply as they can into the curriculum. And they know every single student in that grade level, plus they uh, conference with every single parent at that grade level. We also are a school-wide gate school going into 17 and 18. What that allows us to do is our staff voted to students, every single student at Lowell deserves to have the highest level of instructional rigor. Not having a self-contained classroom where 30 students or 35 students have the access to highly capable and project-based learning, but every single teacher at Lowell Elementary is being trained in highly capable strategies, and so we're doing that school-wide. Um, so we're taking that model into our 17-18 school year, all the way from K to fifth grade. Uh, coaching. Our JAWS teacher is our coach, and so she brings to every single classroom the knowledge of uh, enrichment and project-based learning. She's team teaching shoulder to shoulder to every single teacher K to five so that we can provide enrichment for not, not just highly capable students, but to every student, because every student is a highly capable student. We don't want to have that label uh, to, to, uh, to limit students' capability. Um, we have a stu studio learning lab at Lowell. We've been a math studio school for three years, and we continue that work even without the grant. Um, our teachers watch each other teach, and we bring best practices to our classrooms in math and literacy every day. Data. Data doesn't lie. We can say we're the best school in Tacoma, but now we can actually mean it. Um, by, by what we're doing, what the teachers are doing to collaborate and work as hard as they can, but also to talk with other schools that have similar demographics to Lowell, so we can partner with Washington, Browns Point, Crescent Heights, to not reinvent the wheel, but to continue our, our work. Um, and then parent involvement. We are blessed with one of the largest PTAs in the district. We have a parent involvement that is, is, is um, the best in the city. Uh, they're there to volunteer. They're there to provide activities. Uh, there are 200 members strong. Uh, they provide curriculum, materials, and field trips, but also they're also certificated substitutes in the Tacoma School District. And they are there uh, each and every day when there may be shortage of substitutes in other schools. We, we don't have that at Lowell. We have the gift of having parents that roll up their sleeves and they help us do the work. So 
Um, I'm going to move away from the mic because I behind me is the team of people that have hit the hit, sorry hit the home run for you. Um, they are amazing. So I just want to turn the microphone over to this amazing group of teachers. Thank you. Linda Bostrom, kindergarten since '98 at Lowell. Uh -huh. Jolene Marganelli, kindergarten, my second year at Lowell. Okay. Pat Furch, teach first grade at Lowell, and I think it's like 27 years at Lowell. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was pregnant with my son when I first started at Lowell, and I took one year off and taught in Great Britain and did a Fulbright teacher exchange. Thanks to all of you to allow me to do that and that was a really growing year for me I, I think that was really special and I would like you to do that for other teachers sometime too the student the, the gal that came from Great Britain was accepted by Lowell School and now teaches in international schools and so continued you know doing it in other schools as well and she really enjoyed her time when she was at Lowell too Steve Johnson, I'm the PE teacher. I also work with the struggling fourth and fifth grade students in math and give some challenging math to the fifth grade students. Hi, I'm Carol Stowe, and a lot of your faces are really familiar, Lowell faces. I had Gus in my room. Mm -hmm. I taught fifth grade for many years, and I am now a lap interventionist. Mm -hmm. I've been there for almost 20 years. Close. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sue Keen. I've been at Lowell for nine years, and I teach the fifth grade math program. Hi. I'm Christine Armstrong. I teach fifth grade, and I've been at Lowell for 16 years, and now I'm doing the language arts portion. I'm Leslie Prosser. I'm in the office at Lowell. I've been there for a little over 17 years. Hi, I'm Jenny Vanderbeek. I'm the instructional coach at Lowell, and I was the JAWS teacher the last three or four years at Lowell. And uh, we teach from the heart, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, when we're done, we'd love to get a picture with the board members and all the staff right here in the, okay. in the center. For all your hard work. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hi. Yes, you do. Congratulations. She's a freshman in college and she took a year off, so there you go. <laughs> How are you?
Madam President. Yes, sir. Can I say, while they're leaving, I wanted to say good things about the Lowell teachers before they go because our family has benefited from their dedication to students. So uh, to Principal Rossman, congratulations. Is your mic on? Is my mic on? Kevin says yes. There's no button, so I'm in trouble if my mic's not on. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank the teachers at Lowell. My kids have benefited from uh, their passion and dedication. I have a third grader and a fourth grader there now. Uh, and Linda Bostrom, who's been a kindergarten teacher there, uh, I believe she shared, I'm not outing her, she said since 1998, um, that our oldest had Mrs. Bostrom for kindergarten and is parents know that first time you got to hand a kid off to somebody and leave uh, is pretty traumatic and uh, Sam didn't necessarily want to stay in those first few days and she was terrific so just congratulations uh, Principal Rossman and the staff uh, well deserved honor and I appreciate what you give to our kids every day Madam President may I have some privilege as a Wilson proud Wilson High School graduate class of 61 I want to commend and congratulate our uh, National Merit Scholar Bryce, I know how difficult that is to achieve that. Wilson and Foss have long lines, both high schools, of National Merit Scholars, and we are very proud of Bryce continuing at Port Tacoma Public Schools to be one of the few school districts in the state that has continual National Merit Scholars. Bryce, we're very proud of you, and uh, we're, we're proud of Wilson Rams. Thank you. I just have to add on, mm -hmm. on Lowell that uh, my children went to Lowell and I know that Debbie's uh, children as well as some of her grandkids went to school with my kids at Lowell. So it's wonderful to see some of the same faces there and the, uh, the, uh, the tradition of success in family has been long withheld so making it even better is an outstanding achievement. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Director Winskill, I didn't mean to. Oh no, no, okay. that's fine. Great, <laughs> thank you. Are there any other comments from the board? Awesome. Fantastic, this thank is, you. This is Great. The <coughs> next element on our agenda is item number six. It's members of the public wishing to address the board. School board members, that's us. We encourage public participation. Your input's appreciated. <coughs> if you'd like to address the school board, follow these simple steps. Complete a, complete a citizen's request to speak card, which is located at the back of the auditorium. Submit the card to the school board secretary before the beginning of the meeting. Cards that are submitted after public comment period has ended will not be considered during the session. The superintendent will call your name when it's your turn to address the school board. Please speak into the microphone, and you'll have up to three minutes to share your concerns. Um, Tanya has a clock there, and at one minute mark, you'll get a warning, and at 30 seconds, you'll get a warning, um, so that you know when your time is up, and you can pace yourself appropriately. Thank you. First speaker is uh, Angela Morton. Your formal one, we didn't know you <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Angel Morton, president of the Tacoma Education Association. But I came tonight in that capacity and also in the capacity of a really concerned kindergarten teacher and community member. I'm sure that you guys are all aware of what's going on down in Olympia and the fight to uh, get education funded. And so I brought an invitation to you tonight from my members. We are doing everything in our power to get our voice heard down in Olympia and we want to encourage you guys to join us. Good news, I brought handouts. Um, one side has a comparison of the Senate budget and the House budget, and the other side has phone numbers and ways that you can reach out to your legislatures. So <clears throat> the problem is if we don't get the job done this ledge session, it's actually never going to get done. The House has a budget that funds education. The Senate has a budget that will reduce salaries, increase class size, reduce special ed services. It will take local money and pull it into the state so that we will have less control at the local level. We've done a great job in Tacoma of building up our specialized programs and supporting our schools as, as we've been able to see tonight. And we don't want that to happen. I know um, local money funds 40% of admin salaries so that's a huge, that's salary risk is higher in this building than anywhere else around the district. Teachers will take a hit, but admin will take a huge hit to their salaries. And um, I had one really more good thing to say, and now I can't remember. But anyway, <laughs> we just really want to work together with, with the board. 
and with admin and the community to make sure that we do everything we can in our power to get our voice down in Olympia. Teachers from around the state are occupying the Capitol until the ledge session is over. I was there yesterday with 50 people from around the state and um, just talking and making sure that everyone knows what's at stake. Our members in Tacoma are making phone calls, we're sending emails, we're writing postcards, we're visiting with legislatures. Some school boards are getting involved in different ways. The Bellevue School Board sent a letter to the legislators saying that they supported collective bargaining because that's how you can tailor your school district to meet the best needs for your population. So we would love to see Tacoma School Board do something like that. Next week we're having a general membership meeting to see what else our members might want to do. So we'll keep in touch with everybody here and I just look forward to working with everybody here to make sure that we get this job done because our kids have one shot at this. Thanks so much. I will put these on the back table. Thank you. We have um, several speakers tonight speaking regarding the ELL policy revision. So I ask that um, you don't duplicate uh, because there's so many so that um, if you hear the person before you just said the same thing, then just add those things that you think are, uh, you know, that are pertinent that were not already said. I'm going to call the first speaker and then say who's uh, on bat. Okay. No, no, it's not on bat. On base? Uh, on deck. On deck. Okay, I knew it was a baseball term. I just can't remember what it was. Okay, I'll call the first person and then the other one will be on deck. Uh, Alicia Lemus and uh, uh, after Alicia will be Laura Rodriguez. Noches a todos. Good evening, everybody. Uh, mi nombre es Alicia Lemus. My name is, her name is Alicia Lemus. El, mis hijas son estudiantes del distrito de Tacoma. The daughters are part of the Tacoma District School. Uh, la educación de mis hijas para mí es muy importante. And her daughter's education is very important for her. Es por ello que estoy muy contenta de que se estén haciendo revisiones de las pólizas de inglés como segunda lengua. And she's glad that they are doing like a revision of policies that involve uh, in, like the English as a, uh, and Spanish as a second language to communicate with parents. Um, y me parece justo que podamos recibir um, información um, de, de parte del distrito en nuestra, en nuestra lengua primaria. And she thinks it's fair that the parents get get information from their school in their in the primary language. Um, in mi experiencia con la educación de mis hijas. In her experience with her daughter's education. Uh, puedo decir que mis hijas han perdido de participar en ciertos programas por, por la escasa información que el distrito nos brinda. Uh, in her experience, her daughters have lost a lot of opportunities opportunities to get access to different activities because of the lack of language and communication between the school and her primary language, which is Spanish. Uh, y creo importante que el distrito debería de acatar las reglas que el Departamento de Justicia y el Departamento de Educación de los Estados Unidos um, plasman. So, and she thinks that it should be fair that the, the, the district and the, you know, by law, it should be, they should have access to these things. Uh, y me parece como muy importante es el siguiente punto. And she has import, an important point. Los padres con dominio limitado de inglés tienen derecho a una comunicación significativa en un idioma que puedan entender. So all she's saying is all the information that parents have the right to have this information in, their, in, in a language that they can understand. Por ejemplo, a través de materiales traducidos o a través de un intérprete de idioma uh, either by having an interpreter or the, all the materials translated in their home language. Y a recibir un aviso adecuado con información acerca de cualquier programa. And all the programs that the district is offering, they, they, they should, she thinks that they should be available in their own language as well. Servicio o actividad que sea de interés para los padres angloparlantes. So uh, any service or program that uh, it should be available to people who speak 
Spanish or their own language, any ELL language. Por su atención, muchas gracias. Thank you for your attention. Laura Garcia, I mean, sorry, excuse me, Laura Rodriguez followed by Kimmy Irene Jen. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Laura Rodriguez. And I speak as a member <coughs> of Stanford Children as a and as a parent with three students in the, in the district. I just want to thank you for this opportunity, um, President Ushka, Superintendent, and members of the board. Um, I, uh, as I was saying, I, I appreciate um, this opportunity, and I appreciate the steps that you are all taking to update the ELL policy. Uh, but while I appreciate your efforts, I urge you to adopt a stronger language about identifying and communicating with parents who have limited English. As a daughter of immigrant parents, I still remember the heavy responsibility of translating from my parents. I also, um, well, and although I was happy to translate for them, my parents, uh, translate for my parents, this led to a role reversal. Um, and working in this, in this city for a little over 15 years with Latino families, I have uh, been able to witness a lot of struggles within that, not just role reversal, but just lack of communication. And um, just when that happens, parents are not able to, to help their, their students excel. And so um, I find that the proposed policy uh, is troubling in the way that the school board says they will communicate whenever feasible with parents in a language that they can understand. These two words provide a giant loophole for the district, and it doesn't meet the standard called by the Federal Department of Education, which says that districts must communicate in a language that parents can understand and provide language assistance if needed. Um, I hope that you could consider this, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Kimmy, Irene Jen, again followed by, I believe it's Hiram Moran. Good evening to the uh, school board directors, our superintendent, our uh, deputy superintendent that was there. <laughs> um, I am the interim director for Vibrant Schools. Our Vibrant Schools to call mission is to eliminate educational disparities for students and families of color and those impacted by poverty who are served by the Tacoma Public Schools. We'd like to offer our statement of support for your beginning process of reviewing the current policy for EL in this district. And we're hoping that as you continue the process that we look at the necessary enhance enhancements that we believe we need to have in our Tacoma Public Schools. I'd like to offer just some consideration of questions that you might want to be asking as you go through the process. They are as follows. How does the school honor and reflect the diversity of families, including their languages and cultures? Are staff members trained in engaging diverse families and communities? Are parent meetings and school events scheduled with interpreters present on dates and times that facilitate LEP parent participation? What is the process for determining parents' language needs, that is the home language survey? Does the LA, LEA or school have the L, L the HLS translate into a language common to the community and have, and have qualified interpreters available to help pa parents complete the survey ac accurately. What is the process for providing language assistance to LEP parents or guardians? How does the LEA inform LEP parents about the availability, availability, availability excuse me, of free language assistance services including qualified interpreters and translators. And I want to just have a little side note there. When we say qualified, we're not talking about having the families, and was stated before, having the children act as the translators, but having qualified interpreters. What is the process for determining the LEA staff is competent and appropriate to serve as interpreters or translators? And how does the LEA ensure that interpreters and translators have the knowledge of all specialized educational terms and concepts? We as an organization that are in full support of making sure that all students are treated fairly and equitably in the Tacoma Public Schools, we express, especially in this situation while we're reviewing ELL policies, that we do it with due diligence and that we respect the diversity of all students in this district. Hiram, Hiram Moran, followed by Julio Juan. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Hiram Moran, and <clears throat> thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak uh, with you and give you my point of view about uh, ELL policy and uh, my desire as an educator and as a product of uh, the education in Tacoma uh, for allowing me to uh, be, give my point of view about that. Um, I have here a, a document from the U.S. Department of Justice um, that outlines the, the need for uh, clear and concise, uh, pro providing clear and concise uh, language um, for, for translations and interpretation services. Um, it, it really inspired me because it really, it has a bullet, a bulleted list of uh, uh, contexts in which uh, parents and, and teachers need to communicate and provide that service. Um, and uh, as an educator here in Tacoma, I also see the, the sp uh, sporadic amount of need for interpretation, whether it's report cards or tiny small texts from teachers to parents, uh, and uh, to have clear and concise language around this in the ELL policy uh, is something that I, that I would like to see um, as well. Uh, again, I am, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have four brothers and sisters who are also products, uh, who are also in education here in Tacoma. I have their, their kids, uh, my nephews and nieces. My whole family is invested in this, in this district. And um, I definitely don't see myself as an educator in any other city. Thank you. Thank you. Julio Kwan, followed by Elisa Santel. Good evening, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. <clears throat> My name is Julio Kwan. I retired as uh, executive director of Centro Latino a few years ago, and since then I do a lot of uh, community work. And let me uh, just share with you a little bit of my experience. <clears throat> Before coming to live in the US, I was the director of the conflict resolution program of the United Nations University for Peace. And as such, I was involved in many places around the world uh, doing my specialty, which, which is uh, resolve human needs and especially social integration. And I traveled all over the world especially seeing uh, groups of people coming into other countries, forced or because they want to. But the key element in the integration is the education of the new children. And the key element of that is the relationship between the teacher and the family. I've been in places where the salary of one of you would be this, the, 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 the national budget or something like that. I'm exaggerating. Very poor. It's not a question of money. When the family is involved in the education of the kid, that's when you are successful. There is no way for the kid to have a relationship with the teacher, with the family, if they cannot communicate. It's a question of logic. It's not a question of too much, and you don't need to be a, a uh, rocket scientist to do that. Families have to participate actively if we want social integration and if we want to avoid mm -hmm. children who are not successful and are going to be a danger to our society. Please get the best translation possible so we can have the best integration of the newcomers to our society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, Saint Kyle. You'll get that last name. <laughs> My name is Liesl Sant Kyle. I speak as a member of Vibrant Schools, as a parent with students in the district schools, as a Latina, and as an immigrant who is proficient in two languages. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, members of the board, superintendent, deputy superintendent, President Ushka, and student representatives. Representative. Mm -hmm. Last board meeting on April 27th, a first reading of revisions to policy number 21110, English as a Second Language was introduced. It had not been revised since 2000, and according to staff who introduced a first reading of the revisions, it was OSPI's recommendation that it be updated. 
Although the second reading is not on the agenda tonight, it is my sincere hope that some further thought and effort is being given to the proposed revisions and the policy will be stronger for it when brought to this board for a second reading. According to the district's reports to the board, in October 2015, there were 2,836 students in the Tacoma Public Schools classified as English language learners. This is just under 10% of all students in TPS. But when you think of families with a second language, it's much larger than 10%. This is just the ones that qualified for ELL. I want to express my gratitude for Board Member Cobb's careful reading of the policy and would be very happy to see some of her thoughts or questions reflected in a second reading of a revised policy, including the use of a, the term second language rather than a more neutral word such as additional, the use of the term basic rather than a more neutral word such as standard, a reframe of the language that includes the phrase whose English skills are sufficiently deficient or absent to impair learning to reflect a growth mindset set rather than a deficiency. She had other points in her questions, but I'm going to go on to um, some several reflections of my own. Uh, additional languages are not less than English, and that additional language can and should be framed as a strength. The state is doing important policy work that reflects this thinking, and the workforce is demanding more students proficient in multiple languages. I know firsthand the power and the utility of multilingualism. The process of determining services should be explained more fully and clarified in the policy. The language that says communicate when feasible with the parent of the student in a language they can understand is problematic. This leaves the choice of appropriate communication up to the school instead of up to the parent. The word feasible is not in accordance with federal mandates and any revision should be looking at federal guidelines. There is no consistency within or across the district in how communication with families in a, in a second language who, with a second language unless another policy such as the IEP requires it. This needs to change. Policy needs to guide practice and protocol. You are a policy making board and the work that you do with policy such as this one can make important contributions to increase equity within the school district and can help to reduce educational and academic gaps that we certainly see when we look at the data for ELL students. I urge you to work with community members as you look at this policy, including some of the members who spoke here tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That's, that's all the speakers. Wonderful, thank you everybody for sharing your comments tonight. We very much appreciate it and value your thoughts. Uh, we're moving on to item number seven, which is our superintendent support. Superintendent Cantoro. Um, I have a brief superintendent's report, but I have some really, really, really good, I have some good news and I have some bad news. So I'm gonna start with the good news. Um, the good news is I went to um, Lincoln High School. Uh, last meeting I talked about the performance of Hairspray at Stadium. Mm -hmm. And then this week I went to the performance of Stadium at Lincoln. And, um, you know, great, Great players, great drama, great music at both. Uh, Lincoln had a much smaller cast because they just don't have the number of students that uh, tried out. I learned later that a lot of the music teachers work together, but it was the most amazing thing. Lincoln's um, Lincoln's auditorium is not as um, what do you call it when acoustically, acoustically? It's not as acoustically correct, so it was really hard sometimes to hear what the students were saying. And while I was there, you know, I'd seen um, the stadium production, so it was real easy for me to know what was going on, you know, and you could laugh and whatever. But there was a group of uh, half the audience that was just, you know, just uh, making sure that they cheered on the, ki uh, the kids at Lincoln and made sure that they were getting support. And I just thought it was so great that we had so many young people coming. And then a teacher that was sitting next to me said, do you know those are the stadium kids? And so all, a lot of the stadium kids that were in the production and not came to support the Lincoln kids. And I think you should see this uh, tape of the end. We're not allowed. If, uh, we're not allowed to take tape of the, uh, you know, of the actual performance. But this was at the end, so I think it's forgivable. <laughs> So there's all the stadium kids coming up. Two groups of students come together. 
So I just want to um, say thank you to the, the stadium students and then also just tell um, the uh, Lincoln students that they were amazing, they were mighty, and uh, they were hearty. And, you know, people are always saying that our kids, you know, have problems and that they're not good enough. Baloney. You know, our, ki our kids are incredible and great. So it was such a good example. So thank you. And uh, thank you to our student representative. It's amazing what the arts are doing you know, for the morale and the um, education of our students. So the second news I have is not so good, and it's about Debbie Cavazos. Uh, some of you don't know, I'm sorry, Debbie, I have to do it. <laughs> uh, tonight marks the end of an era. I believe it's important for all of us to know and acknowledge. This is the final school board meeting to be covered by the longtime education reporter for the News Tribune, Debbie Cavazo. For those that, as a reporter, as a reporter. Okay. Still a voter. <laughs> okay. For those of you who have not heard, um, Debbie will be leaving the News Tribune at the end of this week, next week. Uh, most of us in this room went into public service on particularly public education because we have a passion for making a better life for students. And we know two things, that the majority of the time we are making a powerful positive ex you know, difference, but uh, despite, our def de despite our best efforts, sometimes things do go wrong <laughs> and we know that in public service the media particularly our local newspaper will hold us accountable and I've been around long enough and served in enough school districts that sometimes that media scrutiny does not seem fair and you can spend a lot of time worried about it uh, over my eight years here in Tacoma Public Schools I can say without a doubt that the Debbie's coverage of our work has been fair balanced and accurate she has thankfully told the stories of our successes because that doesn't happen in every city where you get the successes in the paper and then she's held us held us accountable when it's been warranted and debbie i can clearly tell you that um, i've had lots of reporters in my life over the years and yours is the only one that comes up on my phone that i still answer it <laughs> <laughs> my favorite piece that you ever wrote i have to tell you uh, I had probably nothing, had nothing to do with education. It was the Beatles quiz, okay. And the reason, I did more than pass. I got rated as an aficionado, aficionado of uh, the Beatles uh, criteria. And I tell my kids that, because I'm always trying to get points with my kids. And basically their remarks were, mom, that's embarrassing. So, um, I just want you to know how much we will miss you. You've been an incredible force. It is going to be weird to look out there and not see you every week. So, yeah, if you can't, you know, I, I don't expect to see you there every time. But I want you to know that um, we appreciate you and you've been a great force for education. On behalf of the board, I can, we can echo Carla's comments pretty easily, and so thank you so much for all the all the great stories and the great times. And I also have to echo that if you're there every week, we will worry about you. <laughs> so, That's true. Thank you. All right. Next uh, on our, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add that maybe Sally and Debbie could carpool on Thursdays. To, <laughs> That's a good to idea. School board meetings. <laughs> Could I, could I just add something? Absolutely. I, I think I probably have known Debbie longer uh, of course. than anybody sitting up here. Debbie covered City Hall when I was mayor, and what we just touched tonight was, um, you know, Carla's comments I want to echo. Debbie has always been um, what the we called the fourth branch of government should be. She has always been fair, and all of her stories have been always done with great integrity. And I cannot say that about all of the reporters that I've worked with. And that goes back 25 years. And I just want you to know, I, I, I get a little emotional because I just remember you being there and how good you were to start. And you were just brand new. So um, we're going to miss you, but uh, fight the good fight because we need the press to keep us honest. And, and uh, it's the underpinning of our democracy. So thank you, Debbie. 
Sure, I'll, I'll make a comment too, since I've worked with you for many years. And um, so it was never a gotcha um, issue with you uh, trying to make, have us make mistakes and say something uh, inflammatory. So I never was nervous when you called and um, you are gonna be missed. And good luck in your next endeavor. Thank you. Moving on in our agenda tonight, the next item is item number eight, which is the consent agenda. I move adoption of the consent agenda. Second. The consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 4-0. As I scroll down, for the sake of our public, the consent agenda uh, does contain a lot of material, but the board <laughs> has received it in advance. We've had an opportunity to do our homework and ask questions. So it looks like one simple pass, but we've done our work on the friend end of that one. And then I forgot what number it was. Nine. Um, nine. Moving on to number nine, which um, in Plato's terms was the perfect number in the universe because it was three of threes. I was a philosophy major, so you can put that in your fortune cookie. Um, number nine is policy matters, and tonight there are none, so we'll move on to number 10, which is the quarterly financial update. There's also none. Um, next, number 11, which is curriculum instruction, also none. Uh, item number 12 is business matters, which brings us to item 12.1, which is the approval of funding for up to two million for school-based technology updates. The Chief Financial Officer, on behalf of the Executive Director of Technology Services, recommends that the Board of Directors approve the use of up to $2 million of funding for technology services to continue technology investments for both students and staff. I move approval. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Are there any discussions or comments from the Board? Director Winston. Yeah, I, I just have a comment because we have a tech levy, and then this is uh, from the general fund. so. How do we determine when we're gonna use it for the general fund as opposed to money from the tech levy? Dave, you wanna come up? Yeah, I'm not sure Dave can answer the general fund versus the capital fund. So each year we talk to, um, Sean and I sit down and work through, Sean, Mr. Taylor, Sean Taylor and I work, sit down and work through um, where we're gonna charge different components of the, the technology expenditures and we do have our technology levy. Uh, we've put in a few things into the capital levy that weren't necessarily planned for and so like um, the my time project or loss in project upgrade um, that, that we had to, to have a conversation around which parts are going to go into which fund so it's not unusual for us to have uh, this level of expenditure in our technology in the general fund but um, we're just trying to do everything in one lump sum to get everything settled and ready to go so that we don't have to come to you multiple times over the next several months and knowing that we have technology purchases that need to happen over the summer to get them into the schools uh, we're not sure how we're going to be able to get that done at summertime board meetings okay any other questions or comments from the board fantastic well then seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying aye aye aye, aye. aye. all those opposed motion passes four zero the next item on the ag agenda is item 12.2, which is the approval of Green River College in Tacoma School District Number 10, interlocal agreement for use of the Lincoln Tree Farm. The Assistant Superintendent for K-12 Support, on behalf of the Director of Career and Technical Education, recommends that the Board of Directors approve the interlocal agreement between Green River College and the Tacoma School District Number 10 for use of the tree farm. I'll move approval. Second. The item's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 4-0. Item number 13 is other business, of which there is none. Item number 14 is the report to the board, which is of which there is none. And item number 15 brings us to board comments and reports. And this evening, let's begin our comments with Director Vial, please. Oh, thank you. Um, the board had the opportunity, and Fair Trust, you can talk a little more about this, to meet with uh, Congressman uh, Kilmer over at Stewart on Friday, and it was a good conversation. I guess if you can call Washington, D.C., conversations good in these days, but about what might happen and what might not happen vis-a-vis -vis our funding uh, for many of our federal programs. So we're all going to sit there and keep our fingers crossed and, you know, and 
talk to a higher power if we do so. So any, anyway, but the one thing I did want to report on is I, I went over to Blix Elementary on Friday at, for Teacher Appreciation Week and they were having breakfast and I wanted to, uh, Principal Cooper said, can you come over and, and give our staff some real kudos because they have moved way up the ladder in their achievement report card this year. And um, I said, yeah, I can, and I did. And they've been working very hard at Blix. But the one thing that I, I found very interesting was one of the teachers said that I've known for years, do you want to come and see the new LLI, if I get it right now, Literacy Learning Intervention Program with our kids, and particularly second language kids, kindergarten kids. I frankly was blown away by what I saw. There were four little kiddos there, and they were all English, second language kindergartners. Uh, they were disappointed I wasn't going to spend the whole whatever it was with them, but uh, anyway, the instructional material, they were reading a little book, having fun at school. They were all at this point very uh, fluent in their reading, and then uh, Ms. Flashman got through part of it, and then they did a, about their comprehension, a little more thinking, and then they got to the writing piece, which I was really in, intrigued with. And they have a book, and they actually write in ballpoint pen, which is part of the instruction. For some reason, it seems like they like to do that. And friend, I've known her, she's taught in our district about 30 years, said, I was a little bit concerned about, because we don't have whiteboard desks, about ballpoint pens, but that the kids actually was easier for them, and it, some reason it, it helps them. But the main point was, she asked them a question, what other things do we do at school besides have fun in what was in this book? And one of the little girls said, um, play with blocks. So she said, okay. So the first word we're gonna do, what's our new word, is blocks. And immediately the kids took their pen, little boy, Stefan, who was uh, kind of running the show, said, um, do we do uppercase or lowercase, Miss Flashman? So this is kindergarten, mind you. And she said, we're going to do lowercase b's in all of our no letters. And they spelled that word out so fast and with the blend of the BL and so on. And they did the whole entire sentence. We play blocks at school without help from Fran. And I thought, you know what? We are on the right track. These kids are now, and she said they're all right at about where they should be for, for first grade in the fall. And that's a program that we invested in. And I said, is this kind of hooked to common core, analytical thinking, and so on. And she said, absolutely. And she said, this is great. And then I was over at Whitman yesterday, and Principal Allen said, same thing there. She said, you want to come see our rock star that teaches it? And I said, I'd be glad to. But I guess what I'm saying is the, the money that we have invested in some of our literacy intervention programs I've seen now firsthand, that they are working and they are getting kids up at grade level. So maybe two years from now, three years, we'll see that third grade reading level for across the district be at grade level uh, and um, anyway I, I was uh, you know very very pleased and the kids were so proud of what they were doing and I'm also you know very pleased to see Blix Elementary on the rise and really doing some awesome work over there so that's all I all I have to say thanks thank you director Barnett mm -hmm. Val director Hines mm -hmm. yeah, a couple things to share uh, mm -hmm. one had an interesting experience last night with uh, my 10U baseball team that I coach. We practice at Jason Lee Middle School. Mm -hmm. And as we were mm -hmm. just taking the field over the intercom, we could hear, uh, this is a lockdown, everybody get into the gym. And a minute later, one of our Tacoma security officers pulls up, and then a couple of TPD uh, with their lights on pull up. So we take our guys with some parents and get them in cars trying to figure out what's going on and more police officers show up. Some of our parents were in the parking lot on the other side and got swept into the lockdown. And, and thankfully, you know, there was a report of a person with a gun, law enforcement responds, and, and, um, and they don't find anybody. So people are safe, people are released. And so a couple of points from that. One. Uh, my wife was in North Carolina, and I get a call from her, is everything okay? Now, I had not communicated to her, but she had been mm -hmm. on Facebook. So the power, the ubiquity, the speed of social media that she's like, what's going on? Uh, 
and then it's unfortunate that we live in a time where we have to have lockdowns and we have to have people trained up mm -hmm. but I'm appreciative that we've made the investment and we have the partnership for when those sorts of things happen because um, those 10 year old boys were terrified and we were in the car the kids that I had the five that I had in my car were joking and and the conversation they're concerned that they're going to get shot so I'm reassuring them that they're going to be okay that that you are fine that police you've got trained police officers there taking care of it that the moment things look like it's going bad we're driving away and you're going to be okay and they started talking about ways to die so I redirected it back to what are you going to do in your young life what are you going to what are things that you want to see and do and accomplish and as I reflected on it last night I think about those kids that are exposed to that sort of violence on a daily basis mm -hmm. and what impact does it have Trauma and racism. and how do we reassure them that they're going to be safe even when they've lost loved ones and they see this on a regular basis so the the isolated incident yesterday with Jason Lee turned out where there were no victims and everything was okay but you know is the the broader community thinking about how are we taking care of these kids when we look at ACEs scores and other research that measures impact and trauma in young people and then the behavior that is exhibited because of that exposure is not just a school-based issue it is an opportunity for us as a community to make certain that kids are safe inside of school and outside of school and Tacoma Whole Child Initiative certainly is a part of that, but it is, it is not going to fix everything. And, and I don't have any answers today, but just, just that awareness of how scared these kids were in that 30 minutes that we were sitting in the car and thinking about those kids that live that every day. I, I just think, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Dr. Director Hines. One of the things that I was disturbed about um, so right, social media is out there, and they're you know they're seeing things, mm -hmm. and I understand that people want to know, but I just think it's so important to our public to reinforce um, that you know be accurate about what you're seeing. If you say, "Boy, there's police activity at Jason Lee," that was true. Um, you know that there's mm -hmm. there seems to be something going on. I saw at least three Facebook posts that said active shooter yeah, at Jason Lee. That, that that is so irresponsible to you know um, project that you know without having any evidence. And so I just hope I, I understand that when we see something, we want to report it and let others know. That makes sense to me. But I just um, really ask the public to be careful about the information they put out and to make sure that it's you know that it's verified and accurate because um, you know it, it piggybacks on exactly what you said is that if we terrify more people uh, there was never an active shooter um, you know the circumstances you know were still scary but nothing, nobody was ever in danger of being shot so it's just important that the public is aware of that Social media can be dangerous if it incites something more because of inaccuracies. Thank you. And my second item on a lighter note, baseball related, uh, and anticipating our meeting on the 25th with Metro Parks, this continued, um, and it's a process, but the, the, the sharing of recreational opportunities instead of having Boys and Girls Club does this and schools mm -hmm. does that, and we've got the Y over here, uh, and you've got Metro Parks, that unified effort with those four organizations to increase the uh, recreational opportunities is incredible. And I experienced uh, during the winter with basketball and then this spring, uh, our baseball team uh, a couple of weeks ago played a team and they had never played baseball before. Mm. Ten-year-old boys, they were football kids. Mm. And I was, uh, when I was coaching third base, I was visiting with their parents. And because of this opportunity, they decided what the heck and these kids and they gave us I've got a good team and they gave us everything that we could handle and they were competing and having fun and learning how to play the game and uh, and we had to come back to win the game and they actually had a chance to win it in, in the last inning and our first baseman made a great play caught it and doubled the runner off of first to end the game if he had not caught that and had gone down the right field line that team would have beaten us and we did our cheers and shook their hands. And afterwards, uh, their head coach and their two assistants came over, 
found our kid, the kid that just cost them the game, gave him a big hug and high fives and congratulated him. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about. It's sportsmanship. They're 10 year old kids. It's not a make or break game. And the fact that we're creating these opportunities, removing barriers, be it financial or geographic, and getting more kids to play and have fun is what it's all about. So I'm, I'm excited to have this joint meeting on the 25th so we can just continue. We've got such a good relationship with Metro Parks. There's such good synergy for us to talk about what's working well and what are we gonna do next. That's great. Great, thank you. Director Minsky. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly mention the film last week, 178 Days, mm -hmm. that was um, done about Stewart Middle School and all the great work they've done to raise their scores and to where they're the third highest performing middle school in the district, and it was no easy feat, that um, uh, task for the teachers and the staff. And I did go also to um, Derek Kilmer the other day, and um, the, it was yesterday, actually, and yeah. they had a little panel of students who were talking to him, and they were so great. So one student had looked him up on the internet and knew all about him before he even got there. He knew <laughs> where he'd gone to college and all this stuff. Uh, and then others had, uh, they, uh, many of them had gone to the youth and government, and they had to come up with bills. And one of them came up with a bill. Uh, college costs are way too high in the state, and they need to be... Um, curtailed. It was really, they had some really good legislation that they had proposed, so they have a wonderful teacher there. My, um, Stuart, uh, Michael, Debbie Cavazzo knows, uh, Gilbert, who was, worked for the News Tribune, who does all this government things. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed with those students there. They're very, very sharp. And um, they asked him, uh, Derek Kilmer, really great uh, questions, and he asked them lots of great questions, and I thought it made a big impact on them, so. Great, thank you. I'm going to piggyback on the 178 days for a moment and kind of give a PSA. I had the opportunity to see it last night and I found it to be a riveting and moving experience that left me speechless, which if any of you know me, that's a heck of a lot to say. <laughs> um, you know, when we talk about uh, the every student every day and the hard work and the continuous improvement and everything else, um, seeing it in action from through faces that we know and love and seeing the kind of work that and thought and emotion um, and intelligence that our, that our teachers put into raising the bar for our students and helping them meet it uh, means something. Um, so if you haven't seen it yet, I highly encourage it. I think that you're gonna regret not having taken the opportunity for a community conversation if you didn't, um, particularly if you're interested enough to be watching this meeting. Um, it's gonna be shown again next Wednesday, I believe also at the Grand, I believe well, tickets Monday. are- Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday. the Monday. 15th. Right? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be shown again on the 30th of May? Is that correct, Dan? Yeah. So, 30th at Stewart. the 30th at Stewart Middle School, Monday, May 15th at the Grand Cinema. I believe if you go to the uh, Tacoma Public Schools website, you can uh, click a link to fig figure out tickets and reservations. Um, so, we don't know what's going to happen from there, but it is a, a. I also encourage the dialogue that might be inspired from this movie. Which leads me to the other question I was thinking as we we're talking about some things during this meeting about what happened in the last meeting and trying to think, why wasn't I at the meeting? And it's because I was in Texas. I had the, uh, uh, the honor of joining a TPS team at the Cosbo Conference, which is the, which is the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. Mm -hmm. And for all of us, when we go to these conferences, you know, we're leaning in to find out what we can learn, what gem can we bring back. Mm -hmm. And while there'll be a broader presentation from that group, um, a couple things, a couple reflections that I want to share. One is uh, in a workshop that was all afternoon with mostly principals that I snuck myself into, as I told some of the stories of the things that we've done to change our common understanding of what our institution is and to change the path, people literally said to me, you're wrong, it can't be done. <laughs> and these were leaders in different states, and I was like, but, but we, you know, and, and it was lost because they couldn't hear it. So I, I say this particularly because as we're telling the story of 178 days, it kind of shows people that it can be done. And in lots of ways, I think that our nation mm -hmm. and particularly our educators um, locally, but also nationally need to understand that hope for public education. Public schools can do it right. Um, we're some of the hardest working people on the planet um, from uh, every building everywhere. So I want to say that. The other piece that I pulled away from it is, you know, we work a lot about with the whole child initiative and behavior internet invent intervention strategies about how do we build resilience, how do we build grit, how do we get people to go to the next level and raise that bar, but then how do we get them beyond that, right? And we're still also pretty darn unique in that we're looking at what are people's fifth year plans and how do we 
follow them and help them to, uh, uh, for re not just retention, but completion through college. Um, those are important things. Otherwise, everything we've done over the last 12 years has been for naught, right? We want students to succeed in whatever they choose after this. Um, so the piece I brought back is self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say self-advocacy out loud because if we give students everything else and all that hope and they don't have the self-advocacy to make it through the day-to-day -day of um, getting through a college environment, I work at a college environment, colleges work really hard to make it seamless for students, but it's complex. Um, so I just want to put that out there as a point of conversation, quite frankly. Um, we've, got a long, we've come a long way, but I think that there's so much more that we can do. And last but not least, I also had the privilege of taking the respite of seeing hairspray at Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. I was very sad to not have been able to make it to Lincoln or to Stadium as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was an outstanding performance. And I, I had happened to talk to Superintendent Centorno about the evening before. I went on Saturday and she went on Friday. And the moment of the play that that happened is really about um, young people coming together for civil mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. in the face of a, a, a broader community that didn't want to listen. So the powerfulness of that moment um, shouldn't be lost. And so uh, just my kudos to our students across the district that have joined together in that unity and, and thanks. I, I have um, a question if I could ask. When you're absolutely, saying. Director Vial. I want to um, piggyback a little bit on what Director Hines said, because this is something that's bothered me for a long time. Having spent nine years on the east side of Tacoma, I had kids that I taught who had seen family members murdered in front of their mm -hmm. eyes and that whole concept of trauma with our kids, it either, it either had them so emotionally unstable, they had very difficult times dealing, or had had family members, gang drive-bys, that was not an unusual thing, or domestic violence. They either were very emotionally unstable, or they were so, had blocked it out so much that they were incapable of dealing with emotion and feeling. And I know that there's a lot of science now on trauma mm -hmm. and how that affects that. And I would like to see us track some of that and look at how that fits in with the whole child. I'm not asking immediately, but because there are so many of our kids in this district that I know personally that have been affected by what you were talking about directly, mm -hmm. that I would like to see us make that something that, and maybe we are doing it now, um, I thought we were, but uh, I sit here and I kind of have tears in my eyes because I, I could start off and I know at least 40 or 50 of them that were affected by that. Uh, and I'd like to know what we're doing at some point. Not now, we've got, you know what, I'm sometime in a study session or a superintendent report. So Dr. Garcia, did you wanna? Because it's critical, I think, to a it's lot one of, of the these main, kids uh, making it through life. Pillars of the Tacoma Whole Child Initiative is trauma-informed practices. Uh, many of the assessments that we do working mm -hmm. with students are to get a feel of where they are coming from. Um, there's uh, advanced tiers of support inside the schools that, are, and this is all based on our partnership with the University of Washington Tacoma. And so we have re national researchers out there talking about what are the trauma-informed practices that can be infused in the schools to help minimize. The effects of the outside world inside the classroom and then how do we teach kids the skills to deal with some of those things process them and get them the resources that we don't have inside the community to process these these very difficult parts of their life so aces adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. um, is some of the data that we collect in order okay to i'd so also like to know how do we follow that long term because we deal with it when it happens in the school building but these kids carry those scars a long ways mm -hmm. and, I, and I do we I guess I want to know if we are aware of that and some of that I think has to do with some of the behaviors that I know have happened later in their lives yeah so in 2012 you made a bold statement and said every elementary school should have a social emotional learning mm -hmm. plan um, that work was built in conjunction with these trauma-informed practices um, I've heard comments from individual board members of how do we extend that that's um, what I'm so there's a policy gap a, a opportunity there if you choose um, to look at what does that mean for secondary schools um, and the work that happens there. Um, once students leave us in June, July, August, October, November, December of their senior year with a diploma, um, it's more difficult to track back, but our hypothesis is if we give the skills and teach them how to access I the resources. I guess what I'm asking community. is that middle school, high school gap, I really do think that we need to look at that about with the whole child extending that social and emotional learning because those scars don't go away. I know that. 
Um, so we need to work with our board president to identify and uh, if the superintendent and, um, and then we'll work on a policy potentially and uh, we can share with you some of the steps that we already have in place and as we're working okay, and then um, uh, you can uh, decide if that's a, 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 a benchmark that you would like to further I'd I, would, I personally would like to see us really pursue that because I think it's it's critical for a number of our kids as they grow up and handle themselves through uh, we know that middle school years are hard, high school years are hard, and if you've got, and in some cases, many of our kids are still in situations in which trauma is still occurring. So, I, I personally would, I would, I would like to ask my colleagues perhaps to join in taking a look at whether we need to uh, have a policy that extends our social and emotional learning to middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I'll work with the superintendent, and the deputy superintendent, to find an appropriate study session Great. time for Thank it. Thank you so much. I think you're welcome. I think that it's. Uh, uh, you know, as we talk about um, resilience and grit and self-advocacy, ACES is part of it. You can't take it away entirely, but you can make uh, self-directed, you can help people become self-directed, self-advocates. reinforce what you and Director Heinz are talking about um, as we teach us more coping skills. As yeah, and I know that I, I say that without uh, an intent to put yet a higher bar on all of the very difficult work that our teams do but just maybe to inspire creative thought towards how we can mm -hmm. uh, work in that direction as well. So thank you very much, everyone. And with that, I'm gonna move on to item number- President Ashka. Deputy, oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm smiling at you about hairspray the whole time and I forgot <laughs> to give you an opportunity. I'm so sorry. Student Representative Olson. She only has a few left. I know, you only have a few left. You're gonna have to come back and visit us, you know. Will do. Okay. I'll see you guys at graduation. That's yes, for you sure. will. Um, I have a comment about the ELL policy. Yeah. I'm not very informed with it, but um, I do remember growing up, my dad was a, oh, sh I don't want to cry. Um, it's all right, I've almost all night, it's okay. Um, coming from immigrant parents. Um, I know the struggle of, um, having to watch your parents struggle <laughs> at conferences or just in public anywhere you go and being that kid translator and it kind of takes away from being a parent and and I remember my dad had to, he was a custodian in Northeast Tacoma and I remember he would have to be a translator for so many parents because they didn't have that ability and it just the, that hits home and I'm so passionate about everybody having an equal opportunity, especially at school, and it's something that I hope this district pushes because it's something that so many kids struggle with. And yeah, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> but it's something it's I really nice. want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, the, the, the mystery of why the ELL policy isn't back at you this meeting is this because the staff heard your comments, uh, have heard comments, and is doing more work on it. Good. And so it, that's, um, we have to re-clarify some things with OSPI. Uh, our chief counsel has looked at different policies, reached back out, and so it's just an example. I, uh, uh, folks are, that we're not uh, dismissing it we're doing more due diligence work on it to enhance it to make it the best that we can and so we're hearing the comments tonight and so um, we're, we're willing as a staff to push on the timelines uh, in order to do better um, no policy may need be perfect ever um, but we can do better and then as we learn more we'll do better again so that's why it's not back at you tonight for a second reading thank you and thank you, Student Representative Olson, for your thoughtfulness and your courage and your mm -hmm. compassion. Uh, President Ashka. Okay. Director Hines. Uh, just, I, I will try to be brief. I appreciate uh, that, too. That's, I can't guarantee it. Uh, but to uh, oh, oh. Deputy Superintendent Garcia's point, when we think about policymaking 
and I expressed this when we had the study session on partnerships and Amanda Scott Thomas uh, told us about the Parents Advisory Committee that is reviewing policy um, and that comment is I think it'd be great to invite families and the community into the front end of making policy instead of mm -hmm. at times it almost feels perfunctory hey we're getting ready to pass this what do you think oh we got it wrong yeah. maybe we can get into this rhythm and I hear opportunities with community engagement around trauma another potential policy and, and and I'm not suggesting right now that it becomes the process for every policy. We, some may be pretty straightforward, but for these policies that we anticipate are going to have such a profound impact on families and community, if we can invite, figure out a way, we've done it with our discipline advisory committee. We've brought people into that process. It helps to create transparency. It helps to create um, partnership and collaboration. And if we can figure out how to do something similar with policy, I think it's going to pay dividends. Because then when we get a first reading, oh, has this gone through on the front end? Has this gone through our families and community members? Have they had input? Because we've got really talented, smart people out there that say, there's a school district that's doing this, and we think it would be great in Tacoma. Mm -hmm. We had no idea. And then that allows us to have our general counsel take a look at it, and then we can tweak it. But I feel like as innovative as we are, bringing family and community in on the front end of policy making could really help. I think that sounds fam fabulous. And if it pleases our peers, let's make that the second agenda item on that study session when we discuss the, the other topic. Seeing affirmative heads nodding. Thank you very much, Director Hines. And if there's no further comments at this point, I am going to move on to the next item, which is the announcement of future board meetings. Um, on May 2017, we'll have a meeting on uh, May 25th at 4.30. We'll have a joint meeting with our partners at Metro Parks. And on the 25th, we'll also have our regular business meeting. I do want to make note for those of you that plan ahead that we will not have a meeting on June 8th as previously uh, or regularly scheduled because there are graduations take place, taking place and they absolutely take precedence over this meeting. Um, if there are no other comments, oh, oh, you might want to mention again that the 18th study oh. session is canceled. The May 18th study canceled. I apologize. I'm receiving a message that also the May 18th study session has also been canceled. So there's no study session on the 18th of May, and there's no meeting on the uh, 8th of June. I am absolutely certain that our district website is up to date with these dates. If you're uncertain, please check there. Uh, we refresh it as quickly as we have the ability and knowledge to do so. Uh, moving on to item number 17, it's executive session. Do I have affirmation that there is no executive session? Wonderful. And then uh, moving on to number 18, seeing that this is a regularly scheduled meeting, if there is no further business, and again, if there's no further business, and seeing no further business, I therefore declare this meeting adjourned. No. I've got to give time to this. It's for yes, I think that we're in a regular meeting at this point.